holy crap, this fight, this next fight was absolutely nuts. You had Merab Valishvili versus Marlon Marias. Uh, Merab was a decent favorite coming in. Uh, and I was pretty confident he was going to win. He had seven straight wins entering. Marlon, I think, has been exchanging wins and losses. Let me remind myself who he fought last. Marlon last fought and lost to in in order. So he lost to Merab, he lost to Rob Font, and he lost to Corey Sandhagen. He beat Jose Aldo, and then he lost to Henry Cejudo. So entering this fight, he had lost three of his last four. Now he's lost four of his last five. Uh, but to start, he looked dangerous, to say the least. Uh, for because I we I had Merab in like all my parlays. He was the last one on one of my three like parlays, and then when that was happening, I had actually forgotten I had him in my parlay. <laughs> so I was like, "Damn, Marlon's about to win. This is going to be the end of uh, Merab's streak." And then he looked absolutely dead. Merab looked like he was gone. Like it was I don't know how the hell he was even running around or anything. Uh, and Keith Peterson, dude. I don't know what the hell he saw that he's like, nah, I'm going to let it ride. I'm going to let this go a little bit longer, but I'm glad whatever that was, he saw it. Yeah. Because the fact that somehow Merab was able to end that round on top and almost finish it yeah. after how that round had kind of developed in that first middle portion, he almost finished it yep. <laughs> to end that round. He was on top just going crazy. He was literally doing this, the, the baby hammers. And I was like, holy crap, what is happening here? Second round starts. Dude, he, I, to, he showed some serious power, man. Yes, he did, man. He was dominating. He was dominating Morias, man. It, it was the, the night and day between those two rounds. Like, we rarely see that. And I remember uh, when we were watching him, we, uh, me and Busta looked at each other. We are like, hey, man, this is going to be fight of the night. We had two other fight of the night candidates um, earlier on the card. But this was just a – this was awesome. That that it's rare that you see that kind of reversal. We saw one last weekend with um, remind me who was it where the situation ended up being reversed like that again. Uh, uh, I, know, I think I know what you're talking about. There was the point is there was another fight like that on last weekend's card where it just completely flip flopped and we were all stunned. Anytime you see that, I think. Oh yeah, um, um, Tony Gravely and Nate Maynus. Yes, there you go. Yeah. There you go. It was kind of a similar situation where we're like, "What is happening right now?" You know, <laughs> that's, that's awesome to see that. You know, because you know that the fighters are actually putting in their all. They're putting in effort. It's not just let me get some let me get some points under my belt. Let me get some strikes. They're going for it, dude. Love it. Love to see it. After that performance, you would have no idea that Merrill and. Uh... <laughs> Uh, Aljamain Sterling are tra training partners. Uh, are we back to that guy again, man? Because he looked fine to me. He looked fine. <laughs> yeah, he, he didn't look like he had any issues. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I think let's 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 finish off discussing these two, and then we may as well just kind of briefly go off track and talk about Aljo a little bit. Um, so again, yeah, great performance. So that's eight in a row for Merab. Entering this fight, he had eight straight decisions. And I, you had taken the under on this. And I said, I don't know, bro, that's pretty bold. And then I checked our sheet. I had actually picked the under, too. I had forgotten I had done that. Uh, but he won. When, when was this in the second? It was early in the second, right? Uh, he finished it? Oh, no, late in the second. Four minutes, 25 uh, seconds. Yeah. So he still had a, like he still had like five minutes to – no, not five minutes. About three minutes to spare for, for to go over. Uh, but dude, he, the shots he was landing, I was like, man, he obviously is strong because the way on all his other fights, he just takes people down. Almost, he just ragdolls them. So he obviously has strength, but to see his hands in full display, the way we did this fight more so than, than his ground game was nice to see because again, each time a bantamweight fight, a good bantamweight fight comes up. I always say it, this division is already so stacked. So him, seeing him do that is great. It just sucks that currently Sterling is champion. That won't be for long anyway, because he keeps saying, he's like, if Sterling's champion, I'm not going for the belt, uh, which I understand. I, I, I respect when teammates don't want to fight each other for the belt. I don't really, I have no issue with that. Uh, and I, I really respect him because the fact that he's like, if, if Aljo's, because he's he, being the nice guy that Merab is, he said, I expect Aljo to be champion for a long time. So I'll just move divisions. Really? Again, that's commendable. Yeah, he said that. Um, the biggest bullshit ever. I don't, I don't <laughs> He's not going to be the champion for that long. 
but yeah, so uh, props to Merab. Uh, I think he has a bit. Uh, if he fought Aljo, I'm taking Merab. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would. Yeah, too. I'll probably take Merab. I would too, dude. Uh, I mean, because he has. He he started looking a little bit like Jan the way he was uh, jujitsuing uh, Marias up, you know, and we saw how that went for uh, Mister Paper Champ. And all things considered, I mean, if we're gonna talk, hey, about Aljo that, had a lot going on entering the fight, man. I don't give a shit, man. You know what? Like, it's starting to upset me, and especially people that defend the guy. What are you seeing in that? That you? Th- oh, well, you, that's why you shouldn't throw illegal kicks. What the hell does that have anything to do with Aljamain's performance? He was. Terrible. He was terrible the entire fight. It, the 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 writing is just starting to get really aggravating, dude. And now what's the excuse? What's the excuse now? Oh well, no, it's just well because his neck and blow. Get the hell out of here, dude. Get out of here. Vacate the title, or they're obviously going to have an interim. I'm guessing, right? They're not going to strip. Yeah, the, the discussion. The last thing I saw this was uh, yesterday, I think, that they're eyeing uh, Jan and Sandhagen for uh, again October thirtieth. I don't dislike it. Um, TJ's hurt, so it wasn't going to be him. Uh, Sandhagen, had he won against uh, TJ, was clearly going to be the next guy up. Whoever was going to win between Jan and Sterling clearly would have been against Sandhagen. TJ winning obviously screwed that up. I don't. I would not have if TJ was healthy. I would not agree with him fighting for a title. Because number one, he only won one fight after, what was it, three years away or whatever. And number two, the reason he was away was because he was caught taking performance enhancing drugs. I don't think, I'm all for redemption, but I don't think a one fight victory is enough redemption to then propel you to a title fight. I don't like those one hit wonders when someone wins once and then they're like the same reason I didn't like when Michael Chandler won and then he got a title fight. I get it was kind of situational, but I just didn't like that he already right off the bat got like something like that. Yeah, it's the same reason why we didn't want to see Leon Edwards just jump right into it. You know what I mean? Like we we said the same thing about him too. He needed to get a fight or two under his belt coming back after that long of a hiatus. At least Leon was a little bit more understandable because it was like COVID messed it up for him. He had a couple of fights get jacked because of COVID. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's so true. I was I'm more understanding of it on Leon's end. Uh, like I don't like Yair fighting for the title either if he wins because again he was caught for juicing too. Even if he beats Max, and then yeah, Max has been on a tear. I don't think he deserves it because of what you did to get suspended. You weren't out two years because of injury or because of COVID related. So if you're out two years because you were juiced, so I don't think you should get rewarded immediately for it. But that's why I respected TJ's performance against Corey because given that he stopped and he still did what he did, I was like, all right, pathway is definitely there. I don't think you earned it for the next one, but cool. Regardless, not the point. So with Sterling. Um, my issue with him has been because the argument I've seen is like, how is it his fault? He got a legally need. It's not his fault. I don't really like the rule in general, not just because it's Sterling or that it was Jan that lost. I don't like the rule of titles changing hands over disqualification. It just seems weird. Uh, and like not a competitive decision. It's not decisive. Like if I was in that situation, if I was the one that got need in the head, it feel like I wouldn't run. I think most of the fighters have kind of agreed with this. Like they wouldn't do what Sterling ended up ultimately doing, running around and, you know, being on oh, the champ, I'm the champ. Because initially, we all remember Sterling like was like, no, nah, I don't want the belt. Like, that wasn't a win. Good reaction. That's the correct reaction. And then he decided to lean in and, like, start posing for pictures and doing this and doing that. That's why people don't like you. Not because you got need in the head. That's not your fault. That was Jan's stupidity. That's not the issue. The issue is to all this hoopla ever since of you parading it and trolling or if you're trolling that doesn't matter like there's funny trolling and there's a stupidity that you're doing that's why people don't like you well, it's not problem. because yeah there's such big yawn fans where they're like he, sh- he shouldn't have lost no he should have lost because those were the rules yeah, the rules are you can't do what he did push it to that's no a contest loss. push it to a yeah. no contest and have them rematch for it no you give know, it a loss i'm fine with it being a loss it's not even no i don't think it's a no contest because it's clearly stated in the rules you can't do that it's just strange to change belts because it's not like a like you, you didn't get knocked out or finished or went to decision, but fine, whatever. Let's say the changing the belts happened, no problem. The all the crap you did after is the issue. DC said it. DC because DC, uh, I think when he fought Jones or something, something had happened. I think with Drew, something happened with DC too, where he was like, I wasn't parading the belt, and I think Anthony Smith talked about it too. Anthony Smith's like, look, if that was me, I would not have done what Sterling had done. I wouldn't be. And I think most people that are legitimate competitors, if they were in a similar situation in the UFC, 
I don't think you're going to feel fulfilled. You'll be like, ah, let, let me fight him again. And without doing all this crap, he almost, yeah. tri- he was one foot in, one foot out. I want to fight Jan. I don't think he deserves it. I want to fight him. I don't think he deserves it. Okay, I'm going to fight him. And then he's like, and then he starts saying, you know, I'm still having issues with the neck and this and that. Too much flip-flopping, dude. That's why. That's that's another reason why people don't like you. Too much in this, like this and that, this and that. Pick one thing and go with it. Not not this whole charade. Yeah, they, he just doesn't seem like a, like there's nothing in Aljamain Sterling that I would like respect. You know what I mean? Like, no, look at I have Brandon, zero respect for it. Look at Brandon Moreno. You know, he takes the title and still decides to fight with Figueredo. I think like that's how a fighter should be you know it shows like he's got honor he's got respect for his opponent and clearly it shows that his opponent respects him because of that like there ha- man have a little bit of like have a code dude like at this point it, it doesn't seem like he has a code which makes sense given that he's got actor in his freaking twitter bio yeah you know yeah so he's a he's a this. tool bag um I'm glad that they're scheduling an interim fight because if they didn't, that's an absolute spit in the face to Francis as well. <laughs> Given this guy didn't fight for four months yeah. to schedule an interim. Yeah. This ass clown hasn't fought for six months at this point because he's too busy tap dancing. And was that picture that Pusa sent us real with the champagne thing? Did you see that? Where he was like drinking champagne and there was like a chick's ass in front of him or something? Oh, I didn't something see that. I haven't seen that yet. No. I couldn't tell if it was real or not. <laughs> Check the chats later and look at it. I couldn't tell if that was an actual thing. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like I I, I try to be obje- as objective as I can be, given that all the stuff he, Sterling has done so far has made me really dislike and disrespect him. Um, because it's just stupid. It's, it's childish. It's acting. I get he's an actor, but this is dumb. I don't know if he was just trying to build it up. It's, I can't even say he was trying to build up the fight because then he pulled out. You pulled out with a month to go. I mean, you knew your if I don't know, man. Whatever, whatever. I'm well, just glad that they're getting an interim in the meantime. Yeah, so, so that they don't hold don't up the division. division. That division yeah. is in a position where it can't have bullshit no, like can. this going yeah. on. It's too stacked. You can't slow down this division. You got to keep it going. Yeah, I agree with you. That was just a slight aside. So Dana cut him. Next, we had. Uh, so these guys, I think, honestly, the next one, Hooker and Hawk Cross, I think should have gotten like a, a some kind of checkup for both of them. The fact that they were able to make this work uh, and make weight and not make any weight concessions. I get obviously the UFC helped get them here with the visa issues. Uh, but the fact that they showed up with the very difficult circumstances that they were both in, made weight in like a day. And then, granted, Hawk Cross didn't do too much, but Hooker looked really good. Yeah. Commendable for both. And then, <laughs> you look at Nick Diaz. He's like, eh, let's bump it up 15 pounds. <laughs> so, two different schools of thought and mentality there. So, I respect both of them for putting it up. But let's look at these numbers for Dan Hooker because it was just an onslaught. What is that? 73 to 27. So Hawk Cross, it was, it was very strange seeing him kind of – not perform. I was gonna say perform the way he did, but he didn't. He really didn't perform. He opened I don't up know in the third. Was... He was he was very slow in the first and second, but I think it's just because of the pressure that Hooker had on him in the first and second. Um, because the minute he got a little bit of space, uh, which I want to say was right around in the third. Well, then I think he realized too. I have to I have to finish him. Um, when he opened up, he opened up. You know, so. Maybe he was in that uh, weird state of mind where it's like, oh, I'm fighting Dan Hooker. You know, the, the mental thing maybe kicked in again and it, it made him be a little bit more tentative than we've seen him be before. Yeah, I don't I, I couldn't tell if it was it could have maybe it was just a combination of what you said, the weight cut, the the time, tra- the I'll say time travel, the traveling and then the time adjustment and then the emotional difficulties he's going through to his mom just passed. He had to bury his mom and then fly back. So a lot going on yeah so um it was probably a culmination of all those things because hawk cross is good i mean he was originally gonna fight solid young i think it was earlier this year and i think there was visa issues again back then or something happened uh and that could have been a problem of a fight too but props to hooker because he got his last fight was not good i mean he that was when he got absolutely walloped by michael chandler um and it was very quick and you know to lose to the ufc's new shiny toy the way that he did is rough uh 
So he was on a two-fight losing streak. Granted, the one before that was against Dustin Poirier, and that was an absolute war, one of the best fights of last year. This is a big win for him because had he lost this, oof. I'm not saying he was going to get released, but it's like, damn, man, now, again, another stacked weight class. What the hell is going to happen for him? I don't agree. The, the call out for Benel Dariush was random. Yeah, was I don't crazy. know if he had been discussing this. I, I don't follow him on Twitter or anything because I know him and Saro kind of been going back and forth. But calling out Dariush, dude, you lost two fights in a row. You just be hot crossed. All right, cool. Dariush is on like, what, a seven fight winning streak or something? He just absolutely handled Tony Ferguson. No, no sorry, not, not Tony Ferguson. Who did he just beat? Was it 21st? Yeah, right? Dariush? Uh, I'm also having a brain fart. Give me a second. Benel Dariush. Yeah, I think he just manhandled Tony Ferguson. Or, uh, yes, you're it correct. Up, right? It was. Okay. Don't second doubt yourself. This guy's got one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, seven fights in a row. Buddy, you just lost two fights in a row and one against uh, Hawk Cross. Why the hell would Benel Dariush fight you? And then he's like, if you don't, if you don't accept, you're a coward. I mean, I get it. That's kind of a baited thing. Cause like, oh, well, now if you don't do it, I'm gonna just call you coward because it's like, dude, you're in no position to fight. Darius, you could argue should be fighting for a belt, either one in one fight or the next one. You, not not you, <laughs> not you, Hooker. Uh, so that was a stupid call out. I think a wasted call out. I asked you guys, I'm like, do you guys think he says anything about Zarogan or not? Whatever. I, like, you don't need to fight him, but you're definitely like you shot way too high. <laughs> you you overshot like crazy. Not a chance you're fighting Benel Darius. <laughs> Yeah, I, don't, I mean, uh, I don't even know if Zarkian's going to be on Hooker's map, but, I mean, it might be an interesting matchup. Then again, I don't know. I feel like maybe Zarkian has a couple more fights, or maybe at least just one more fight. Um, it's hard to say, because this division's another... But I mean, they're all stacked. They're all stacked. But lightweight especially is one of the more ridiculous divisions to be in, because look at the top five. Poirier, Oliveira, Gaethje, Chandler, you know, and then Dariush following up in fifth. It's... You know, it's it's stacked, man. So I, I don't think it's necessary for Hooker. I don't think it's necessarily illogical. I mean, it it makes sense for him to fight Dariush if he's trying to progress up to the top. Um, In that regards, yes. But it's like, dude, again, your trajectory versus his. You just finally rebounded off two assault, two losses while this guy is riding a great streak. Sure. That, that, that's my only thing. It's like, who else is otherwise, yeah, for sure. If, if you somehow were able to land that fight and you beat him, that's huge for you. You just beat a guy on a nice streak, but like you haven't earned that, in my opinion. I don't think he's uh, he's there quite yet. Well, that's fair enough. And then uh, we had like this one was Chris Dawkins, not Kyle. Yeah, this was Chris. Chris Dawkins and Shamil Abdul 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 this guy is terrifying. Chris, Chris Dawkins' power in that hand. Yeah. First of all, it, it, there was a, a little bit in the beginning where I was like, oh, shit, is Chris Dawkins going to lose? Because he was a decent favorite. He was a two-to-one favorite. I had him in my in my parlays. And then and then it went from, hold well, on, he's it's looking a little strange, to holy crap, I think he knocked out Shamil. And then the round ends. Keith Peterson, was it Keith Peterson no, again it was, for that uh, It was Mark the Murderer. Mark the Murderer, yeah. <laughs> uh, he almost he let's go. Let, he almost let Shamil die in this fight. Yeah, man. and then <laughs> comes back in the second round, and Chris wipes his ass out again. Um, dude, the amount of spit that that guy had flying around from the first punch and then yeah. the second punch leaves me wondering what is going on with the salivating glands. Like, why is there that much spit in Somebody, this guy's mouth? One of the commentators said something. I think it was DC. Was DC it? like one of the funniest things DC has said. He's all like, man, this guy's got a split flying all over the place. I'm supposed to walk in there right now and talk <laughs> yeah. with Chris Dawkins. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Um, all right, so this is so he's now four and zero in the UFC. I think that's five wins in a row. He clearly has power. Yeah, he does. Obviously, but again, with the heavyweight division, because you were just mentioning all the divisions are stacked. Heavyweight division is the one that is super top heavy. Um, like for example, uh, okay, but so all, he just all won. of it sits in. Uh, all of the top heaviness is on Nganu's shoulders and chest and, and yeah, like <laughs> Chris Dawkins was what, at like number 10 entering this fight. But I think Shamil was higher than him. I want to say it was, it was seven versus 10. I think DC said he was number six. He being Shamil. I don't think that was right. Shamil at least is, Shamil is 10 right now. 
Shamil is 10. Yeah. No, no. The, okay, so I'm looking on UFC site. So Chris Dawkins was 10. Shamil was on 7. This isn't updated yet for... This will update on Tuesday. So, okay. You have above Dawkins, Augusto Sakai, Tibura. So I'm now... Okay, from there. So here's who's, here's who's above him. Sakai, Tibura, Rosenstrike, Volkov, Blades, Lewis, Miocic, Gum, and Francis. Okay, so he might... He'll leapfrog Sakai for sure. He might leapfrog Tibura. Tibura is going to be fighting Volkov sometime soon. I forget which card he's on. And then after that, it's number seven where Shamil just lost. So Dawkins is for sure going to be at least number nine, possibly number seven, or maybe eight. Maybe they bump Tibura to seven and then give Dawkins eight. I and think, then from there, you have, I think you have the big boys. More, I think the ESPN side is more up to date, man, because the way they're showing it. ESPN, right now, they don't refer to ESPN's rankings, though. They look at the UFC site rankings. Like the numbers you see is what UFC has. So I'm looking at UFC's website right now because they update their website's rankings on Tuesdays. Okay. And so Shamil is seven on that? Yeah. Yeah. On ESPN, he's ranked 10. So yeah, I don't know why, why, would, he have moved, why would he have moved up? What is ESPN's rankings? Where do you see that? Are you looking at like uh, ESPN's rankings on their yeah, site? So if you go to ESPN.com uh, and then go into the MMA section, open up uh-huh. divisional rankings. Oh yeah, that's. I think that's just their rankings, like who they think it is. Oh, it's some not the actual thing. rankings. Yeah, exactly. That's oh, like ESPN okay. subjective okay. rankings, where okay, the okay. numbers we see during the events, that's like UFC's actual rankings. That's like you and I do our top ten, and I say Shamil's number eleven. It's like, okay, you think he's eleven, but he's actually number seven for the UFC. Okay, gotcha. Uh, so, I mean, at this point, he called out a few people. He called out Stipe. He called out. Who else did he call out? I think he called out Volkov. I'm looking at it here. He's called out Volkov. I think he also called out the winner of Blades Rosenstrike. I mean, I, I, when he was calling out these names, I was kind of like, dude, those seem a little bit too high. But now that I'm looking on it, he doesn't have that much left in front of him. I don't think he should fight Sakai. I think Sakai's on a downtrend. I think Stockers has taken over there. Yeah, maybe he does fight Blades now. He, he be. I don't think he should fight Rosenstrike. I think Rosenstrike is fallen from grace kind of or you can maybe you give him rolls and strike but it'll be kind of interesting to see what they do with doc is because the thing is i look at him clearly has the raw power but like once he fights someone that has any semblance i mean again heavyweight's a little different so who has ground ability in the heavyweight division you have tibura you have volkov you have blades obviously you have stipe gom can kind of do everything and then francis maybe might be able to do it because he showed he showed what he was, his movement on the ground when he was fighting Steve, it was terrifying. Yeah. So he hasn't fought anyone yet that I can remember that's going to kind of, that's pushed him on that regards. If it's going to be on your feet, he clearly has a strength there to go toe to toe with most of the guys ahead of him. But what happens when he fights Blades? Is he going to be able to defend the takedown? Is he going to be able to defend uh, any kind of effort like that? Maybe. I don't, I'm asking because I don't know the question. So I'm curious to see, So I'm trying to gauge what is his, is he just one of those guys in the division that's just going to be able to collect the check, but never truly progress and fight and contend? Or is he going to actually have a pathway? And I don't know the answer to that yet, just because I don't think we've seen him challenged fully uh, in like a, in a holistic way. But I don't know. We'll see. I, it depends. Again, I'm kind of curious to see who they think they see him fighting next, how he handles that. 4-0, again, good start to have five wins in a row. You haven't lost in the UFC. But, again, the heavyweight division is top-heavy. So those big boys, the, the toughest ones are still there. It's not like the lightweight, the bantam, the middleweight, where even unranked guys are animals. Yeah. I, I mean, I got to be honest. I, I don't really have an opinion on this either way. Because um, I think the heavyweight is also in a weird spot with what with uh, John Jones and – like I, we don't know really what's happening in the division. So <laughs> that guy's got enough on his plate. Let's see if that even ends up fighting ever again. <laughs> um. All right, those are the big boys. Uh, not too much to talk about on this next one. I'll, I'll do, I just had one point I want to touch. So next one we had Talia Santos, Roxanne Modafferi. I think it's time for Roxanne to retire. She turned thirty nine and then lost. Coming into this fight, I don't know if you saw this stat. She had alternated wins and losses for nine consecutive fights. <laughs> Lost win, lost win, lost win, lost win for nine fights. And she had lost her last fight coming into this one. 
So people were like putting out some black voodoo magic out there and saying, did she pull it off? Does she, cause she's, she's pulled off some upsets. Yeah. So she was a very heavy dog here. At one point, I think Santos was around minus 425 or something, or maybe more. Uh, but dude, Santos looked really, really, really good. Yeah. So the one I was going to text you guys while we were watching, I didn't. I was like, I'll just, we'll just save it for the show. I, I mentioned the disparity between Valentina and everyone else. If Santos can kind of continue to build, granted, again, I don't think Monteferi is crafty. She's obvious, she's a vet. She's been, she be, officially became the most. I think what is the most fights in new women's MMA history? I think that was her 50th fight yesterday or 49th fight, something like that. Uh, so someone with a lot of experience like that, anything can happen. So the fact that she absolutely handled her, shut down any attempt she had, her she her gas tank lasted. Uh she looked she looked very dominant. I think if if Santos, like of looking at everyone below, I think futures wise, Santos might have the best bet. But this is kind of more of a long-term play. Yeah, yeah. She obviously still has some to go before she even gets in that contention. But she might legitimately be someone that could be an issue. Uh, she's beat Molly McCann, who just won. She's beat Jillian Robertson, who's absolutely terrible and should not be in the UFC. Uh, and then she beat Roxanne Mataferi. These are her last three fights. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to get like way too ahead, but... Just again, looking at the landscape of the women's divisions in general, but specifically the flyweight, because this is what they fought at. If you want to try and get optimism behind someone that maybe at some point could pose a little bit more of a challenge, it could be Santos because she's strong. She has a very strong ground game. She showed she has some strength behind her punches too. I mean, honestly, it's pretty impressive that Monteferi took the shots that she did. Yeah, uh, I thought she was going to get finished at one point. I think it was in the second or something. She, she took uh, a beat down, dude. Yeah, she did. That's why I'm saying she's 39. That was her 50th fight. Just call it there. Uh, I don't know what else she really has to offer, but whatever. Props to Santos. That's that really the main point. I just wanted to hammer with the Santos one is to mention that she could be someone that has uh, some kind of future in the flyweight division. Because, uh, again, these women's divisions are – each one is top-heavy. You go, like, four or five in, and the rest is just whatever. Yeah. It's like it doesn't matter. They may as well be unranked <laughs> is yeah. how it is. So we'll see. Uh, I'm, I'm curious. Like, whoever Santos fights next, I'm going to look forward to it because she's an absolute animal. 